Welcome to the November 14th meeting of the Oklahoma City Post-Employment Benefits Trust. We'll call the meeting to order. First item of business that we have is to approve the minutes of the meeting from October the 10th. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Next item is to receive or the presentation of the investment performance review uh, for the period ended September 30th, 2016. Doug Anderson's here with Bogdan Group to present the information. Good morning, almost everyone. Called, almost called the Gregory W. Just out of uh, I would answer to either nostalgia there. Yeah. <laughs> and and more to that point, on page one is pretty interesting. Um, to confuse matters even more, uh, firm is undergoing a branding exercise. We will be changing our name first quarter of next year. Oh, man. <laughs> it's funny it's that you said that. Again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And although I have been asked, it will not be the Anderson Group or anything <laughs> like that. Uh, our, our firm has been around for a while. It's um, named after an individual. And that individual has moved away from the firm. Um, he's still involved, but we're much bigger than just one person. So the name change is reflecting that. Um, we are in this business to benefit our clients. And the name change will be something that, that says that. Although. It has not been disclosed to anyone outside of the executive team, and no, no matter how much we badger and pester them, they won't say anything to any of us about it. Um, so we're going to go through the September 30th report and the October 31st report, and I want to point out at the outset that the returns actually, when we're looking back from October for, to September, they look pretty different between the two of them. The September is the, uh, I guess, the, the more uh, the higher return report of the two, um, but. Again, markets are extremely volatile. We've been through these times in the past, but if we can skip past the market environment and go to page 10, looking at the total fund, one year total return of 10.5%. So that's a fantastic result, and it's one that we've been waiting for a long time to see. Uh, we go onto pages 12 and 13, we can see the allocation. Steady upward progression of returns here. We've had some periods that we've, uh, we, we've given back some market uh, returns, but we've seen some nice, nice gains from the total allocation perspective. We started out with uh, going all the way back to to 2009 with a little bit more than um, uh, just about 6.8 million dollars. If I remember correctly, and we're almost at 48 right now. Most of that, most of that comes from cash flow, though. Um, a great deal of that. We're in trying to enhance the increase in cash flow and funding for the system with modest added value on, on the outside, but we do have a relatively uh, active allocation here. We are uh, productive on equities over the long term, and that's why we have roughly 70% in equities and 30% fixed income. And remember, we're trying to hit a 4.9% rate of return as consistently as possible. And with interest rates where they are today, that's very difficult. If interest rates were to move much higher, we might reconsider that 30% allocation of fixed income. But math is math. And if you have a yield of 2%, it's really hard to get a 4.9% rate of return on a 2% yielding bond. So that's where we are. You can see the following two pages, the asset allocation. I saw a nice increase in market value from June 30 to September. Again, a lot of that is cash flow. And remember, the return figures that we show are net of all cash flow. So those are taken out of the equation. 10% gain means a 10% increase in the value of the investments, not a 10% increase in the size of the fund. Those are two different things. Looking on pages 16 and 17, we show the total fund rate of returns as well as the individual fund options. And we'll keep it a little bit on the shorter side here because we have the October 31 report. But if we look on the top row, $41.795 million. For the quarterly return, 4.21%. That ranked in the sixth percentile of all public plans. Um, for the last one year, 10.55 in the 18th percentile. Notice that because you have more equities than a lot of other public plans out there. Three point three year return of 4.12 below the benchmark. But again, we're not doing super great versus our peers on that. Um, that's something that we continue to address every quarter, every month that we're here. For the last five years, 7.99. That's increased uh, pretty dramatically, but we've seen we've outperformed by 3% per year, our actuarial assumption on that. And then over the last seven years, 6.59, again, above. But we have a lower allocation of equities at the very beginning there. We talked about that uh, recently. 
about how when we started, we were very cautious. We started in a highly uh, unusual market environment for uh, equities and for fixed income, and we were a little bit gun-shy at the beginning on investing heavily in equities. And that led us to invest much more in fixed income, which coming out of the market uh, bottom, the great financial crisis was not the place to be, uh, but it was the safe place to be. It was not the place to be to produce the highest returns, but it was the safest place to be invested at the time. Looking at the individual options here, uh, the investments that we have, the first one that we look at is Loomis Sales Bond. That's $5.3 million. This is a aggressive core fixed income portfolio, meaning it invests quite a bit in um, more aggressive parts of the corporate bond market over the last one year is up 9.15%. Remember last year, this is our poorest performing bond fund. Very difficult, but the recovery out of that uh, difficult market has been excellent. Ranked in the first percentile of its peer universe and outperformed its benchmark by almost 4%, which is big, big numbers in the bond world. Uh, double line is the next one. Uh, slightly more cautious on the credit perspective, but the results have been uh, quite good as well, 6.07% uh, for the last year, 17th, percent, uh, 17th percentile rank. Uh, this portfolio is, is a well-rounded bond portfolio, and its portfolio manager, Jeffrey Gundlach, was one of the few people to publicly predict successfully the presidential election much earlier this year. Um, and that is a lot of what he does as he looks at uh, large um, potential changes in the economy and the bond market, and he expresses those views in the portfolio. So quite prescient um, investor there. Our high yield portfolio is up 11.63 for the last year, 10th percentile. Um, it is very difficult to outperform that index. Nobody can replicate the index, and it's almost impossible to outperform in an a increasing bond environment, but we are happy with those results. And then fixed income, the last one there is a Hoisington. 15.49% uh, for the quarter, and or for the year, I'm sorry, which in a bond uh, yielding environment of under 3% for a 30-year treasury is remarkable. And again, third percentile rank, unusual bond portfolio, does a lot of things for us, and we'll allocate, we'll talk about allocating additional assets to that shortly. The 500 index is doing what it should. The drives appreciation is doing what we have uh, seen it do higher or lower highs and, and lower lows as well, but that's only apparent on the upside here. The mid-cap index is doing what it should. The Hotchkiss & Wiley mid-cap fund, you can see, had a fantastic quarter, doubling its benchmark rate of return, which is something that it can do. Um, and if we look at it for October, we had a, a slightly different result there because they have a lot of energy investments in the portfolio. And then over the last year, up 8%. Steven small cap, slow recovery. Um, this is investing in a part of the market that is uh, unloved right now, sort of cautious or conservative growth companies, uh, neither having the high growth nor the low risk that the market tends to, to look at right now is either ends of the spectrum. Uh, but we like how the portfolio is invested. And then the Causeway Fund, 9% uh, of the plan's assets, uh, relatively young investment, uh, over the last year, it did underperform uh, a lot more in Europe and a lot more in financials than the index. Um, and then also some of the emerging markets exposure is, is not done as well as we would like. I want to turn to pages 18 and 19 just to show some of the, the volatility of rankings here. And although we don't have extensive histories of these funds, um, looking at the year 2015 as a whole is illustrative, helps us understand how some of these portfolios can jump around. Uh, the Loomis Sales Bond Fund, the one that's in the first percentile right now, looking back, was in the 100th uh, because of some credit exposure that they had. Double line, much better than that. And looking down at Hoisington, uh, while they're great right now, a year ago, they're on the 97th percentile of their peer universe. Dreyfus, what we would expect. Going down to the others that were existence through the entire year within the portfolio. Uh, Stevens and Causeway International. Uh, still not performing how we want to, but we understand what we're investing in and we like long-term what those portfolios look like. I won't talk about the individual fund pages, but uh, maybe uh, just given the discussion that we're going to have shortly, if we could turn to uh, page 28, looking at, this has a, covers a couple of issues. 
um, at the Dreyfus Appreciation Fund, which is that large cap growth equity vehicle. And if you look at its 10 largest holdings, uh, very recognizable, all of them. Uh, one of, or two of those top five holdings address a question um, that was asked about how much tobacco exposure is in the entire portfolio. Uh, when we look at this one, they're significant. They've got almost 9% in two uh, of their portfolio holdings, Philip Morris and Altria. Um, those are both relatively large exposures, and they've been in the portfolio for a long time. Uh, so that is our, our most significant uh, tobacco exposure in the port amongst the individual portfolios. The Vanguard 500 fund has 1.7% in tobacco. Causeway has 3.9% of their portfolio. That gives us, uh, at a total portfolio level, less than 0.2% uh, of the overall portfolio is allocated to tobacco companies. Um, so more comfortable knowing that figure than not knowing it because it is so very low. Um, so after we talk about the Dreyfus Appreciation Portfolio, I th need to uh, quickly go to a few housekeeping items. Um, as far as page 41, the manager status here, uh, we are under we're, we're conducting serious review of Dreyfus and how they fit in the portfolio. So I'm not recommending any changes to status here, given that we're working so hard on that. And then on page 42, looking at the fees here from a fiduciary perspective, we look at the fees of the individual funds versus category average. And when we do a weighted average of everything, the weighted average expense ratio is 0.54. The category expense ratio of the same weighted average is 0.75. Uh, so a little bit of a rounding issue. Total uh, difference is 0.2% to the, to the good for this fund and a savings of $75,000 uh, in manager expenses per year. Uh, so from a fiduciary perspective, we want to make sure that we document this page. Uh, page 43 is the allocation. You can see the bars show you how you are allowed to be allocated versus the investment policy statement. Uh, the solid black line in the middle of each of those bars shows you your target allocation, and the green arrow shows you where you are versus that. So uh, talk a little bit about fixed income in a moment. That concludes our September 30th report. Are there any questions on the September 30th report? Can you go ahead and move into the October 31st report? So looking at the October 31st, October was a volatile month where you saw oil prices go down because OPEC couldn't get their act together again and a lot of other volatility. Uh, looking at the total market value, $40.8 million, but we were down 2% on the month. And looking at those individual monthly results, uh, Stevens was down, high volatility. They did outperform their benchmark by a small margin. Vanguard was right on their benchmark. Hotchkiss did suffer some underperformance because they do have allocations to uh, relatively small or mid-sized energy companies, which hurt them pretty badly. But the biggest piece on that one month, as far as the largest negative return, was on Hoisington, where you saw interest rates starting to move higher. Uh, they've moved higher since then. Remember, higher interest rates, long-duration bonds mean lower bond prices. Um, so they did decline 5.39%, uh, setting us up for a very attractive uh, window to invest in that fund, uh, given the interest rates are now higher than they were uh, as, as of September 30. Looking at the last one year results, you can see how that's um, gone down considerably um, as we dropped off a very good month at the end, so 2.63%. Uh, that's something that we can build on. Remind me, Doug, on the on the quarterly report, are yeah. those are those figures actually on the performance, uh, the individual managers, are those net of fees? Yes. And the on the monthly reports, those are gross of fees. They should all be net. Okay. They should be net. I mean, it's okay. taken from the same place. Okay. Great. Thank you. Other questions? So we can go ahead and go ahead. Really quick question, uh, Doug, and it's just for clarification. Uh, on Alpha, when we look at Alpha, are we looking at Alpha in comparison to uh, the expected return or benchmark performance?
forms. So alpha is one of these, uh, the, the trio of figures that you have um, when it comes to alpha, beta, and R squared. They all come together from the same regression uh, formula. So uh, it's versus a benchmark. You cannot have an alpha independent of a benchmark because your alpha is an expression of added value on a risk-adjusted basis versus that benchmark. Good question. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Doug. So I would take a motion to receive the monthly preliminary performance report for October 31st, 2016. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Next item was discuss the trustee question that I think you already answered um, when you were having your discussion on the issue with how much we have invested tobacco. in tobacco. So I think we've already addressed that one. Uh, item six is discussion of any changes in allocation, and we do have an item, and I asked Doug if he would just kind of review what we discussed in investment committee mm -hmm. on the fixed income recommendation, um, and then we can act upon that. Sure. I think it, it has, it always helps me to have some numbers in front of me, but if we look at page one of the, the monthly report is one place we can look at this. So currently, um, the Luna sales bond, the double line bond, our two core bond portfolios, um, at 12.9 and 12.7%, and then you'll see Hoisington at 3. Uh, after our discussion this morning in investment committee, uh, comparing the risk and return attributes of those three and how they interact with the rest of the portfolio. Uh, that discussion uh, led us to uh, come to a, an agreement that we want to reallocate, and our recommendation to reallocate is to have 9% in Luma sales, 9% in double line and that 3% that we're taking off of both of those um, to add that to Hoisington. So it will be 9, 9, 9 amongst those three, and still three allocated to Lord Abbott High Yield. Move for approval of the recommendation. Second. All in favor? Aye. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. The next item we have is um, renewal of the agreement with United Healthcare, and this just renews our agreement for the management of the HMO as well as the Medicare Advantage plan. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Next item is acceptance of the interim financial re statement for the three months ended September 30th, 2016. And Amy Lucas is here from our accounting services division of the finance department to present the information. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, trustees. Um, if you will take your financial pages out and if you would look first at page number three under the management discussion and analysis. Give you a second to find that page. Switching documents. <laughs> All right. Currently the trust is reporting net position of 45.85 million. This is an increase of 7.8 million over prior year when the net position was 38.05 million. The approximate gain is primarily due to appreciation of our investments of 5.93 million, which is giving us investment income of 3.56 million compared to an investment loss last year of 2.36. And if you, I'm not sure that that number's on those pages. I should have said that first. If you flip back to page two, um, towards the top in that chart, if you look at the investment lines, that's where you'll see that change in investments from the 39 to the 44, being a five million swing there. So overall, our financial position has improved during the year. And then next, I want to direct your attention to a couple items that are back in the notes, starting on page 10. At the bottom of that page, you will notice that our money markets used to pay claims are reporting at $2.81 million. And then if you'll flip the page, at the top of page 11, that's compared to prior year of $3.60 million. Um, from, from this time last year in our money market fund. And then lastly, if you will flip one more page to page 12, um, underneath the asset allocation guidelines, um, looking at the fixed income securities, they're reporting at 34%, 
leaving um, the remaining equities at 66%. And if you'll notice, we're really, really close to our target um, percentages with our actuals there. Are there any questions that I can answer regarding the financial statements for September? Are there any questions? All right, I would take a motion to accept the um, financial statements. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you, Amy. Next item is ratifying claims. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Great. Thank you all. Are there any other reports, comments from trustees, staff, or interested parties? I just wanted to uh, thank Doug for the uh, investment committee meeting this morning. I thought it was a very good meeting. I think it's very good for us to have that opportunity to um, have very open and frank discussions about um, the way the, the um, portfolio is invested. So thank you so much, Doug. I appreciate it. There were a couple of items that I wanted to make the board aware of, and I don't know if I, I know Laura and Diana are aware of this, but I hadn't talked with Frank or Ted about it, but a couple of items of action that the council had taken that will affect the management of the retiree health insurance. Um, they took the action last Tuesday. Uh, one item was a resolution that was approved by the council, um, and if you've been tracking very closely on the indemnity plan for those retirees under 65, their rates were going up very significantly. Um, it's a, fall, a smaller pool of uh, retirees that are, that are in that group. And um, so the action that was taken was personnel department worked to come back with some option of what we could do to help try to um, reduce the impact in this next year. And on the indemnity side, there are two different plans. One's a lower deductible plan. One is a higher deductible plan. The majority of the people that are under 65 on the indemnity plan are on the lower deductible plan. The decision was made that the city would step in with its contribution that comes to OPEB and contribute a larger share to, to absorb some of that increase, about half of the increase, for those on the higher deductible plan. Um, and so we can provide any other information on that to let you know. But what it does is those that are on the higher deductible plan, I think it reduces their increase. Those that are already on that plan from 56% down to 28%. By this, and that's just a temporary change, too. I want to make sure make that clear. That it's just for this year to help kind of soften that, that transition to that higher cost. Um, but it would lower those who are already on that higher deductible plan by, by to, from 56% to 28% increase. So it's still a significant increase for those on the higher deductible. But those that are on the lower deductible plan, if they choose, they'll still have to pay the 56% increase if they stay on the lower deductible plan. If they choose to move to the higher deductible plan, and it would actually reduce their premium. And on the higher deductible plan, you assume a little bit more out of pocket, but it's not a significant amount of difference. But it would actually reduce their premiums if they make that change. So it gave them that option, so the council approved that on Tuesday. Um, the second item that we took forward to council that we've been discussing with the council for a number of years on making some changes for eligibility to help um, reduce the impact of our liability. So the OPEB liability that we have right now is calculated at about $440 million is the total liability that we have if you look at OPEB like you would a pension system. We've got about $40 million, or at least at the end of the year, it's a little bit better than that now, but had about $40 million in the fund at the time. So our unfunded liability in that uh, in, o in OPEB is $400 million. <clears throat> to try to address that, help address some of that liability, there are a couple of changes that were recommended to the council. One was to change eligibility. Right now, if you work for the city for five years and you're 55 years of age, you would get the same benefit as someone who worked for the city for 25 years, a retiree health benefit, for someone who worked 25 years and had a full retirement with the city. We're changing that eligibility to 15 years of service and 60 years of age. So it's from 5 and 55 to 15 and 60. It did grandfather in anyone who's already qualified for the 5 and 55, but anyone else that would come into that in the future would have to comply with the 15 and 60 to be eligible for health benefits. And that'll reduce some of the impact on the OPEB fund, uh, some of that liability. The other change that we made was the council approved a change so that anyone hired after this, uh, January 1st, 2017, would not be eligible for a subsidy for retiree health insurance. They would still be eligible for any retiree health insurance to participate in any re retiree health insurance that we provide, 
but once they retire, they would not be eligible for a subsidy if one is still provided at that time. And so just a change for long term, and that way employees coming in will know that they wouldn't be eligible for that subsidy. So that's two changes the council just made that will have an impact financially, uh, ultimately, on the um, OPEB trust. And, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to uh, let Mr. Wanto know that uh, letters have gone out to all of those uh, non-Medicare, those under age 65 retirees, letters have gone out to all of those individuals uh, letting them know about the additional city subsidy for plan year 2017 only uh, and giving them an opportunity to change, uh, switch to that uh, higher deductible uh, indemnity plan if they so choose. So letters have gone out. We have already started having meetings uh, with retirees. So if you get any questions, feel free to refer them to Colin Fonda in the Benefits Office. All right. That's all I have. And if there's nothing else, we are adjourned.